Got anything to say? I have something to say. The saga of Dune is far from over. Hello listeners, welcome to the Non-Toxic Fanboys Podcast, where the name is aspirational and where the saga of Dune Watch remains far from over, as we revisit Frank Herbert's Children of Dune, the miniseries adaptation of the second and third books in the series, starring Alec Newman, Alice Krieg, Susan Sarandon, and some no-name nobody named James McAvoy. I am Glenn, and here with me as always is Scott. Scott, whose collar are you wearing? I'm wearing the collar of the commitments we made to our patrons to actually get an episode out every month. (laughs) Because if it wasn't for that, we would be doing this episode sometime in the second week of January instead of trying to rush it out by the end of December. January of what year? (laughs) Of course, most people won't hear it until the first week of January anyway, but... We hope to get it up by the end of December on our Patreon feed. Plug, plug, plug. Patreon.com slash fanboys. Plug, 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 plug. If anyone wants to get me a nicer color, <laughs> give us some of that Patreon money so that we no longer have to make a living as water thieves selling the water of our fellow Fremen. So, Children of Dune, adapting Dune Messiah and Children of Dune. You might have to help me out a little, because I think you remember the exact machinations of the books a little better than I do this time around. I read these books in, like, 2001? Maybe? Yeah, that's around when I read them. Maybe Messiah and Children I read in the 98-99 rather than 01. I mean, I went back and reread a lot of... As I was watching this, I kept pausing it and then going back to read passages from the book like, wait, did that happen that way in the book? Or, I don't remember it that way. What actually happened in the book? So I did a lot of going back and rereading passages of the book while I was working my way through the miniseries. I'm not sure if that impacted my appreciation of this show, actually. Because I'm actually a pretty big fan of this miniseries. I guess just to jump right into it, you know, spoilers, I liked it. I am a really big fan of the Dune Messiah section of this miniseries. I think that may be the best Dune adaptation that we've gotten so far, is the Dune Messiah episode of this Children of Dune miniseries. And the first episode of Children, I am actually very fond of. There are definitely a lot of changes from the book, but the changes are mostly ones that I don't mind, at least in the first half. There's a lot of changes that streamline the story. There's a lot of changes that make production easier, frankly. And there's a lot of changes that, like, ways to communicate the backstory to the audience since it's not a novel, you know? And I think they do a really good job of that in the first half of Children. And all the changes they make there, I think, are in service of communicating the story more effectively to the audience without losing the story the way they did in the 84 movie and the way they did at times in the Dune miniseries from 2000. And I'm not sure if I feel that way because I don't remember that book as well. You know, the changes they make don't bother me as much because I don't remember the book as clearly. I think there's absolutely a lot to like about this miniseries. I found myself really getting into it as I watched it this time as well. One of the things that I've talked about as we've gone through all of these Dune adaptations is the idea that you have to inject a lot of the human drama of it. You have to inject a lot of characterization. And in the Messiah episode especially, I think they really, really did a great job with that. Like, I felt the relationship between Paul and Chani more than in any other adaptation, I think. Yeah, I agree with that 100%. This is the first time that Paul and Shawnee, I actually felt like, oh, these people have a relationship. These people care about each other. And I'm not just like being told they care about each other. Exactly. Like in the first miniseries, they had good chemistry and their scenes worked, but I didn't really get the impression like, oh, these people love each other. 
Exactly. In the Messiah episode of Children, they have a lot of chemistry. Well, they had the chemistry in the first one, but it just didn't communicate the relationship. Like, I accepted the relationship because I know they have the relationship in the book and we're told they have this relationship in the movie, but I just didn't feel it in the first miniseries the way that I felt it in this Dune Messiah adaptation. I don't know if it's the writing or the acting or a combination. I'm assuming it's the writing because, like I said, they had the chemistry in the first one, so I think the acting was okay. But just the scenes they had... The way they showed affection to each other, the tenderness they displayed for each other in that Messiah episode. Like I said, it's the first time I've ever watched a Dune adaptation. I thought, yeah, okay, I can actually see this relationship. I actually think these people care about each other. That didn't happen for me in any of the other Dune adaptations. And there were some similar aspects that carried through into the children episodes. The chemistry between Leto and Ganema as the siblings was exactly what it ought to be. You see in every scene that they share together the closeness that they have, how much they care for each other, how well they understand each other. Like, their relationship, I think, was really, really strong as well. Well, part of that is that James McAvoy is so far and away the best actor in this thing. In any of the three episodes, in either of the books that are being adapted, he's just so far and away better at this than everyone else he's on screen with. It just jumps out at you. Yeah, it may be a little trite. I don't know if that's the right word. It may be a little simplistic to say it was obvious he was going to be a star, but... It's kind of obvious how he became a star. (laughs) Well, I don't know if it's obvious he's going to be a star, but like, even when we first watched this in 2003, I was like, oh, I like that guy. I want to see him in more stuff. Yes. You know, when he popped up again in that Forrest Whitaker movie, I saw that Wanted movie just because James McAvoy was in it. Ooh, yes. I mean, not everyone else is terrible. There are some performances I think are better than others, but most people are doing a decent job, but it just jumps out how much better his performance is than everyone else in the show. Like, even the other people that I think give good performances. He really is fantastic. He invests Leto with all of the pathos and all of the conflict that he should have that involves some very heady concepts that are hard to convey I mean, even in the novel to an extent, and that are really hard to convey in the medium of television. Like, everything about the curse of prescience that all of the adaptations of the first book invest in Paul, and that's really hard to convey. And none of them actually do, except for, like, one scene in the most recent movie? Yeah, not not entirely successfully often. And I mean, I guess we could discuss whether they actually convey that here, but I feel like we're jumping all over the place. We are, absolutely, as we tend to do. Would you like to settle down into one topic? Yeah, let's like actually discuss one thing and actually discuss it before we move on to six other topics. Let's concentrate on the Messiah adaptation for now, since that's the first episode of the miniseries. Okay. One thing we've talked about on the show before is how when you adapt a sequel, you are often constrained by the deficiencies of the adaptation you did of the earlier installment. In our very first episode, we covered the Hunger Games movies, and there's a scene in the second Hunger Games book where Katniss and Peeta fall over in the snow because Peeta is still unsteady on his prosthetic leg. Except in the first movie, he didn't lose his leg. And so in the second movie, he doesn't have a prosthetic leg. (laughs) But they still have the scene where they fall over in the snow. Because in the book, they fall over in the snow. So they had to have a scene where they fall over in the snow. Even though the reason they fall over in the snow was omitted from the first movie. And so it just looks silly. Or at the very least, it just comes out of nowhere. Yeah. They fall over in the snow just because they fell in the book rather than because PETA is still getting used to his artificial leg. And that's the same problem this Dune Messiah adaptation has with the Duncan Idaho Goa. 
Because the whole point of the Duncan Idaho Gola is that Paul loved Duncan and that introducing this Gola of Duncan will emotionally compromise Paul and leave him vulnerable to manipulation and leave him vulnerable to making mistakes because he's in this emotional state because he's confronted with the simulacrum of this dead man who he loved. Except in the first miniseries, Duncan was a fucking afterthought who died an entirely empty and pointless death. Not someone Paul loved who died heroically protecting him. And also, it's a different Duncan. Like, they reveal the guy, and it's just like, who's that? That's some random person I've never seen before. And one of the characters says, holy shit, it's Duncan Idaho. And it's like, no, it's not. (laughs) They recast a few people in this miniseries. And each time I felt like there could have been like a pause and a voiceover, like in a daytime soap opera. The role of Stilgar (laughs) is now played by. (laughs) So, yeah, I think I made that note like three or four times. Like this revelation would work so much better if Duncan wasn't mostly irrelevant in the first movie. Well, it makes you wonder what it might be like if Dennis Villeneuve gets to make Dune Messiah. That's exactly what I was thinking. Except, can Jason Momoa play the unemotional, detached Gola Mentat? I'd, I'd watch him try. <laughs> That's actually, like you said, they recast several of the roles. And, I mean, we can get over how well each one worked. But I think the guy playing Duncan actually does a really good job. He does, yes. That is a hard job playing this, like, calculating mentat, but still managing to invest the performance with some emotion and some humanity. It's the same problem with trying to play a Vulcan. We've talked about that in some of our Star Trek reviews, that, like, there's, like, three or four people in the history of the franchise who have really figured out how to play a Vulcan really well. Yeah. And everyone else just tries to sound detached, and it doesn't come off. This guy trying to play the calculating, data-driven Mentat, but still investing the character with humanity and emotion, he does a really good job. Yeah, he does a really good job conveying the cold, data-driven Mentat who still has Duncan Idaho's love for the Atreides, who is still Duncan Idaho. I just wish that having watched the miniseries, I had a better understanding of what being Duncan Idaho means. And what that combination is like. But I think, again, that's one of those abstract, heady concepts. The reincarnation as a Gola and the limitations that that puts on him and then what it means when he transcends those limitations. That is like a really abstract, difficult concept to portray that I think they wind up doing very well. I think they do a fairly solid job. I mean, like you say, it's a lot to try to convey in dialogue. It's a lot to try to convey without having, like, you know, a two-page aside to explain things. And I think you're right. I think they do a pretty good job of it. Like, as well as they can, anyway. Although we'll have to talk about the scene where he wakes up as Duncan. Yes, we should, of course. But yeah, I think in that scene where he's introduced, where the guild representative in the tank presents him as a gift which raises a whole bunch of questions like are all golas slaves because the guild representative is like we bought him from the tylaxu and we're presenting him to you as a gift like are all golas property that is a good question i mean they're artificially created and like fashioned to their creator's whims That's something that I don't know is even addressed in the books. I don't know if that's brought up at all, but that occurred to me watching this, just watching that scene where he's like, we bought him from the Tleilaxu and we're presenting him to you as a gift. It's like, wait a minute. I'm trying to remember the details of that scene. Like, do they explain what a Gola is beyond just like, we made this from the cells of Duncan Idaho? Yeah, I mean, they they briefly explained that, you know, we found some of Duncan Idaho's ruined flesh and created this out of it. Here's Duncan. They covered, I mean, the broad strokes. Okay. I like the little scenes where he sort of starts to remember Duncan, like before the main scene where he wakes up. 
where he just like remembers a little detail and then he's like all confused about it. Like, why do I remember that? I don't remember that. How did I say that if I don't remember it? Yes. Those scenes, I think, work really well. Yeah, that's what I mean about, like, the little ways that they portrayed, like, the big concept of the character. The only problem I have with that entire storyline is the way they changed the scene in the siege where he wakes up, and the little bit after that. In the book, it's not such a, like, visual, physical thing. It's much more an internal struggle in Duncan's psyche. Where, like, he has this conditioned response to kill Paul, but his Duncanness tries to fight back and reassert itself to prevent him from killing Paul. And then he wakes up as Duncan and, like, doesn't even realize he's still holding his knife ready to kill Paul until someone says, Hey, Duncan, why are you holding your knife? Whereas in the movie, they do this very visual scene where he's about to stab Paul and he's fighting it and his arm is shaking and you don't know what he's going to do. And then at the very last minute, he turns the other way and throws the knife at B-Jazz instead. And that's very effective. It's a good way to display that change to the audience of a movie. The only problem with that is that the way that B-Jazz actually dies in the book is one of my favorite moments ever in, like, all of Dune. (laughs) Where it's after the whole bit with Sightail... After Paul looks through Leto's eyes and is able to kill Sightail, he goes back to his room with Duncan, and that's when B-Jazz walks in. And B-Jazz is like, oh wow, you're Duncan again. And then B-Jazz reiterates the offer to do the same thing with Chani. And Paul is wavering, like, I had the willpower to tell them no once, but now they're doing it again. I don't know if I can refuse this again. And B-Jazz is just like trying to sell it again and again. And Paul says to Duncan, Duncan, as you love me, kill him before I succumb. And that's like one of my favorite moments in the entirety of Dude. I love it so much. I think that's a really iconic line from Messiah. That is an incredible scene in the book. Yes. Which they've completely eliminated by having Duncan kill B-Jazz as part of his awakening. Well, they they simplify it a lot. Yeah, they only have that offer come just once from Sightail, and they condense it a lot. And they do lose that moment. I think it's still effective, but losing that moment does kind of hurt. Oh yeah, it's definitely effective. It's just, like I said, that's one of my favorite bits, and it's just, it's eliminated. For the sake of shortening things. I mean, it is, you know... It is the same offer made a second time. They don't need to spend time on that. Yeah. It is a much more visually appealing reawakening to have the knife, and you don't know which way he's going to go with it, and at the end he kills the bad guy instead of the good guy, as much as Paul is a good guy. Well, uh uh-huh. I also really appreciate how much book dialogue they translate pretty closely, if not exactly. And they do it especially in that whole scene around the birth and Chani's death, which is why I'm thinking of it now. Paul's whole speech he gives to Chani as she's dying, a lot of that comes from the book. I mean, that's why a lot of the dialogue is so stilted and awkward, is because they're trying to take Frank Herbert's writing from the book and turn it into something somebody could say in real life, and it doesn't always work, but I appreciate the effort. (laughs) Yeah, A for effort. But, I mean, they also do that in Children. A lot of the preacher's sermon at the end is also a lot of that comes from the book. I just really appreciate that. I really appreciate when people doing these adaptations are actually trying to preserve the original in the adaptation, you know? Like, you could just take the story of Dune, of Paul, his family is killed by the Harkonnens, and then he becomes the Fremen God King, and whatever. You could take the bare bones of that story and just build your own thing around it, and then you wind up with the 1984 movie. So I really appreciate when they just, like, take whole scenes straight out of the book, when they take, like, a chunk of dialogue straight out of the book. I appreciate those moments where it hews so much more closely to the source material. There's always a tension there where you want to make a good show in and of itself. But anyone that read the book wants to see the book translated to screen. And sometimes those are conflicting goals. But I really liked the way they did that in this miniseries with several scenes and a lot of the dialogue choices. 
I really appreciated that. One of the best qualities of this miniseries, I think, is the way that it kind of weaves between condensing and simplifying things for the sake of television and then weaving back much closer to exactly the way that scenes went or that character dynamics went in the books. I think they did a great job finding that balance, even though some of the dialogue is still a little stilted. But I mean, as someone who read the books, you know, in my formative years, it's a kind of nostalgic warmth and not something that if I hadn't read the books might throw me out of it entirely. Like, what the hell is this inhuman, ridiculous dialogue? The only time I think the dialogue gets really bad is one that doesn't even come from the books. So, and this is going back out of order again, but right at the very end of the miniseries, there's a scene that isn't even in the book. It's like a parting of the ways thing where, like, just putting a coda on several characters who don't really get one in the book. Jessica is going back to Caladan, and Gurney is saying that he's going to stay on Arrakis because he says, Stilgar will need my help to bring peace to this troubled land. It's just, I can't even blame the actor for how terrible that line delivery is because nobody could deliver that line well. Yeah, that's not a favor to do to an actor. (laughs) But that's not from the book. That comes purely from the screenwriter. Also, how is Gurney necessary for this endeavor? (laughs) (laughs) Another excellent question. I mean, I love Gurney Man as much as anyone. But really. But sticking with Messiah for the time being... Can we talk about recurring problems that carry over from the previous miniseries? Let's. We talked in our episode on the miniseries about how 15-year-old Chani was being played by a 30-year-old actress, and how that introduced a lot of... I don't know the word I want to use. Dissonance? Dissonance, excellent. I don't know if that's what I was thinking of, but that's a very good word. And how that introduced a lot of dissonance in the story and in the portrayal. Because Paul, even though Paul always looked like he was in his 20s, he was acting like a bratty kid. And so he seemed younger. And then he's supposed to meet Chani, who is similarly young, except Chani is 30. And it just didn't quite jive. I thought that was actually an improvement in the actress Barbara Kodatova. I thought that was actually an improvement in her performance since Messiah is supposed to be 12 years later. And so she's actually closer to the age that Chani is supposed to be without having to like age her up at all because she was way too old to be Chani in the first one. But then we have Alia, who is supposed to be 15 in Dune Messiah and is being played by Daniela Amavia, who is 37. So... There's a lot of her story that just doesn't work, because a lot of her story is predicated on her being 15. And it's not even like the character is being aged up, because in Children, she says to Jessica, I was 15 when Paul died. So we know the character is supposed to be the same age from the book, except, you know, getting a 25-year-old to play a 15-year-old, okay, I understand. It's really pushing it when the actor is more than double the age of the character they're supposed to be playing. Having that in mind, I can understand some of the acting choices that she made in the Messiah adaptation. Yeah, she tries to act young, but it just doesn't come across well. Yeah, in terms of trying to act young and immature and impulsive. However... And this also crosses over both of the adaptations, I I feel, with the exception of a couple of moments. Her performance is not a highlight. I think it's mostly fine. And I mean, you could argue that with her other memory and her pre-born status, maybe she should seem much more mature than any 15-year-old. But she still shouldn't look like somebody approaching her 40s, (laughs) you know? Yeah, it's just a dissonance anytime she's on screen. It's just... I mean, obviously portraying the whole pre-born idea is extremely hard, and portraying a lot of the conflicts within Alia is a very hard remit for an actor. 
Well, I actually think she does. I mean, we're getting ahead of ourselves again. I actually think she does a fairly good job of portraying Alia's struggles in children, of portraying her deterioration and the possession. I think she does a fairly good job at that. It's just that, you know, watching Messiah, where Paul is supposed to be 30 and Alia is supposed to be 15, and in reality, the actor playing Paul is 30 and the actress playing Alia is 37. You're really straining my suspension of disbelief with that. And that's probably part of why she does such a better job with the material in Children than she does in Messiah. Because by the time Children comes along, she is supposed to be an adult. Well, ish. The other thing is Julie Cox, who, since it's not a recast, it's the same actress from the previous miniseries, so she's only, you know, three years older than she was in the original, but she looks like she's 12 years older. I don't know if the, what they did with her makeup or whatever, but she does look believably older. I think she carries herself with an older, more mature sort of demeanor, and I think the costuming plays a large role in that as well. But, yeah, she really does convey an Irulan who is dissatisfied with her role, but is kind of growing into it. And, again, getting ahead of ourselves a little bit in the Children of Dune adaptation has really kind of embraced the role that she has. Well, that gets into a couple of things I wanted to talk about, because one of the things they do in this show is they add a bunch of little scenes into Messiah to try to tie it into children more closely since they're adapting the two books together in this one miniseries. So they add a bunch of scenes with when Cecilia Corino during the events of Messiah, and like add when Cecilia Corino to the plot of Dune Messiah to try to tie children and Messiah together as if they're like one whole rather than two separate things. And so what that winds up doing is softening Irulan. Because in the book, that's Irulan who's conspiring with Saitail and Edric to try to bring down the Emperor Muad'Dib. Oh yeah, yeah, they changed Irulan's role completely. They soften Irulan a lot. She's still been feeding this poison to Chani, but they completely eliminate her role in this conspiracy that leads to Paul's blinding. And then they also add that extra scene between her and Paul where Paul acknowledges that he's been cruel to her and sort of apologizes while saying he's not apologizing. No, no, no. I thought that was a really good character note for Paul, where he just says, I've been cruel to you, flatly as a statement of fact, not as an apology, just an acknowledgement, just, this is a thing that's happened. I have been cruel to you. Goodbye. See, I saw that scene more as an effort to sort of aid Irulan's face turn because in the book it's just really very sudden like she is part of this conspiracy that's behind the stone burner and Sightail's role like she's part of that conspiracy to try to bring down Paul's rule over the Imperium and then at the very end after Chani dies and Paul goes into the desert there's like one line that mentions oh Irulan suddenly realized she was in love with Paul and is now going to dedicate the remainder of her life to taking care of the kids. And they add that scene between Irulan and Paul in the movie to try to like I guess explain her face turn a little more in addition to the fact that she's not nearly as involved in the crimes against Paul and Chani as she was in the book. I do think it's interesting that they kept the element of Irulan feeding Chani the contraceptives while they were softening her so much. Like, they kept that little bit of an edge on her character. Or maybe that was just a way of conveying, number one, that she is still a player in all of the political games. Like, you can't engage in the politics of this world and be a nice person. Although, we might talk about that in the children bit. Yeah, I'm very interested to see who you think is the nice person in children. We'll see. But I mean, how would you even tell the story of Messiah without the poisoning? Like, there has to be an explanation of why Chani hasn't conceived in 12 years, and there has to be an explanation of why she needs to go on this super spice diet to try to overcome her difficulties in conceiving. 
And there has to be an explanation of why forcing this pregnancy through burns out her entire life force so that she winds up dying in childbirth. Oh, it's not just like Padme syndrome, where your kids are the new sci-fi protagonists, we have no more need for you in this plot? I mean, I guess there's a certain amount of that, but they do explain it somewhat. I mean, it's awfully convenient, but I mean, there is an explanation. I suppose there is that aspect to it. It's a little more subtle than I've been giving it credit for. But anyway, what did you think of those added scenes on Seleucus Secundus to try to tie the story of Messiah into the story of children? They also do have one scene on Caladan where Jessica reacts to the news of the stone burner, again, to try to tie the two books into each other. And then they also just, like, insert Javid into the conspiracy and Messiah in a way that doesn't make a whole hell of a lot of sense. Yeah, they do have that one scene on Caladan where everyone stands still and the soap opera voiceover says, The role of Jessica is now played by Alice Krieg. That brings up something that I wanted to talk about, because that scene is a prime example. All of the green screen effects in this show are terrible. All of the compositing in this show is terrible. Oh, yeah, it's not good. People on YouTube filming stuff in their basement have better green screen effects than this movie does. People on Twitch doing live streams without any post-production have better green screen effects than this movie does. Well, at least until their cats attack the green screens, but, you know. The scene on Caladan... I mean, was obviously there just to tell everyone, hey, this is Jessica now, she's coming, get hyped, stay hyped. That's a little ham-handed, but I get, obviously, why they did it. The scenes on Seleucia Secundus and the changes to the conspiracy to bring Wincissia into it that much earlier, I think, goes a long way toward integrating the books in the way that they obviously had to try to do to make one miniseries out of them. So that, I think, was perfectly fine. And plus, you know, we get a couple more scenes of Susan Sarandon scheming, and that's always fun. And Susan Sarandon casually, emotionally abusing her son. Susan Sarandon is hamming it up like nothing else. <laughs> oh, I know! Oh my goodness gracious! Oh my god, yes. The thing is, I don't even remember her being promoted in the ads that much, like the way that William Hurt was in the first one, where he was like the big star they got to put in all of the ads to try to attract viewers. I don't even remember them using Susan Sarandon that way when they were advertising this one. I tried to see if any of the old ads were on YouTube earlier today, and the only one I found in the brief time I had to look was like a two-minute extended trailer deal, which isn't going to be what you saw during every commercial break during reruns of Star Trek on the Sci-Fi Channel, so I can't really speak to that. But to the extent that I remember what it was like at the time, I believe I remember Alice Krieg being promoted a little more than Susan Sarandon, although she was definitely promoted as, you know, someone whose name you know. Yeah, that's what I was going to say, is that, like, to the extent that they used celebrity casting to promote the show, I think most of that promotion focused on Alice Krieg instead, because she was popular with sci-fi fans after being in Star Trek First Contact. Like I said, I don't even remember them promoting Susan Sarandon that much. Not as much. I think she was probably still there, but I think you're mostly right, yeah. And since we've sort of moved on to children, apparently, I am really, really not a fan of Alice Krieger's performance. I don't think she does a good job as Jessica at all. I don't think she conveys the strength of Jessica. I don't think she conveys the authority of Jessica. I just don't like her performance as Jessica at all. There are moments where she projects some sort of strength uh, when she's confronting Alia, but for the most part, she seems to have made a conscious choice to play Jessica as very gentle and very contemplative and very judicious, which obviously she's going to be judicious, but she is very, very gentle in the role. 
which if that's not how you imagine Jessica, and honestly, it's not how I imagine her either, <laughs> is a bit of a curveball. Maybe I'm judging too much based on her performance in Star Trek, but I kind of feel like she would have been better as a more otherworldly sort of character, like a threatening character. Like, she might have been better as Reverend Mother Mohayim in the first miniseries. I just, I don't think she projects strength and authority the way that Jessica should. I think there's a moment or two. Like, I keep thinking about the confrontation with Alia in court. I think she does a good job in that scene. That's probably her best scene. Yeah. But that's mostly just because she's yelling. Like, any time she's not yelling across the crowd in the middle of chaos, she just doesn't project strength in her voice the way that I feel like Jessica should. She doesn't project that strength. No, I agree. Like I say, she is very, very gentle. I think her scenes with the grandchildren are highlights as well because that gentle demeanor is called for, because that makes a lot more sense. Otherwise, she makes Jessica seem almost passive. Yes, that's it, exactly. Which she really, really can't be. Like, given the role that she has in the story, you have to make her an active participant. And giving up a little bit of that harms the character a lot. I agree. And I have pretty much the exact same problem with the new Stilgar. The new Stilgar? Oh my god. Okay, I have one thing to say about Stilgar. I read one review of the miniseries in which the writer said that the recast Stilgar feels more like the Atreides family butler than a Fremen naib. And I cannot get that (laughs) phrasing out of my head. I read that like while I was watching either the first or second episode. And for the rest of my time watching it, every time Stilgar came on screen, I could not get it out of my head that he's the Atreides family butler. Yeah, I can see that. It's the same thing with Jessica. I think he has more good scenes than Jessica does. He does do pretty good at times. But most of the time, his voice is just very soft and weak and doesn't project the sort of strength that you would expect from a Fremen Naib, let alone the Naib of Naibs. Even when he tries to project the strength that Stilgar has to have toward the end of Children, I don't think he does very well. I mean, there's a very good reason why some of his line readings in the third episode of this miniseries have stuck with us, personally, for like 20 years. (laughs) Well, I think that's one of the great line readings of all time. Great in what way? (laughs) Oh, come on. When Duncan is trying to get him to go over to the Rebels and he tells Duncan to stop needling him or else. I will have your water. Come on, that that is great. You can't not love that line reading. I do really enjoy that. And the scene... I mean, we'll have to talk about the changes they make to children, but the scene where he hands Ghanima over to Alia, but he's like setting, he like sets a bunch of conditions on it and whatever. I think he projects strength pretty good in that scene. He projects his authority in that scene in ways that he doesn't for most of the rest of the miniseries. So he has a couple of good scenes. He has a handful of good scenes, but for the most part, like Jessica, he just seems kind of soft and passive and not projecting strength and authority the way that Stilgar should be. I think the sequences in the Siege where he's negotiating with Alia and he's trying to hold his place of neutrality in the Civil War and and, and the whole conspiracy and everything, I think that's as strong a character as Stilgar gets to be in this series, but he still feels badly done by and really sidelined, other than a couple of those moments. And I still feel like, as enjoyable as those line readings are, I mean, it's hammy as hell. And his version of projecting strength is to just kind of grimace and snarl a little, such as when he sends men to summon worms. I say unto you, send men to summon worms. Worms. I don't know. I like those performances or those bits of his performance. 
on this watch that just came off as ludicrous, given how downplayed he had been until that point. Like, suddenly he's supposed to be the Stilgar now. It all was a little too sudden and a little too hammy. I feel like this may be partly my own problem, because to a lesser extent than Jessica and Stilgar, I kind of have the exact same problem with Gurney and Faradin. Both of them also seem too just kind of like soft and weak compared to how I picture them or how I imagined them in the book. I was going to say, if you're going to talk about Jessica being softened and Stilgar being softened, Faradin doesn't need to be softened by this adaptation. He was always the softest, goodest boy. He's just a soft boy. Yeah, but in the book, he does stand up and act in his own stead a lot more than he does in the movie. In the movie, he's just sort of this wishy-washy, letting his mother do whatever and doesn't stand up to her at all until they get to Arrakis. In the book, he does stand up for himself more. He does stand up against his mother's authority more. Like, not a lot, but more than he does in this movie. I'll admit that after all this time, I do not remember Faradin's exact characterization in the book at all. Well, after Faradin finds out that his mother was behind the plot to assassinate the Atreides twins, he does sort of stand up to her at that point and basically ends her time as the person in charge of House Carino and basically takes over for himself. And, like, he says, well, you know, well, hopefully you at least succeeded. (sighs) Like, you went behind my back and didn't tell me what you were doing, and I'm not crazy about the fact that you murdered people in the training of these tigers, but hopefully you at least succeeded in killing the Atreides twins, so we at least get the throne out of it. But the way you went about this, I'm going to have to take over everything now. Whereas, in the miniseries, he is, I say again, the softest, goodest boy. And he is the one who seems to be trying to be a nice guy here. In the movie, yeah, okay, yeah, I can sort of see that, yeah. Like, he's giddy as Jessica is teaching him the weirding way, basically. Yeah. And then, like, the only thing he does in the story after that is reveal his mother's treachery and, like, throw himself on Ganima's mercy. Like, he doesn't actually do anything conspiratorial or aggressive in this version of the story at all. That's true. Since we're sort of halfway on the subject already, should we talk about other changes they made in Children? Sure. Like, in addition to softening Faradin and adding this entire confrontation with Wencysia on Arrakis, where in the book she never leaves Seleucia? Well, I mean, yeah, that's another television thing. You know, you bring all your characters together. The children portion of this miniseries, the two episodes of Children of Dune, are the, like, perfect example of why we really can't judge the 2021 movie yet. (laughs) because I was a huge fan of this adaptation through the first episode. There were changes that were made during the first episode. There was a lot that was left out. There was a lot that was streamlined. But they didn't actually change the heart of the story, I didn't think. They streamlined some things. They cut a lot out. They reworked scenes so that things could be explained to the television audience better. They simplified things so that the audience would get it better. But I think they were doing a really good job of sticking to the heart of the Children of Dune story. Like, in the way that the 84 movie completely failed to stick to the heart of the story of the novel Dune, and the way that the 2000 miniseries at times kind of failed to stick to that story, or at least failed to properly convey that story. I thought the first half of Children did a really good job of that. And then, like, the very first thing that happens in episode two of Children, is that Leto sneaks away and lets Ganema think he died, rather than the two of them plotting together to make everyone else think Leto died. That change just really, really bothers me. That in the book, the two of them have this plan together, and they come up with this scheme together, because they're twins, and they do everything together, and they're each other's best friend, and they trust each other more than any other part of their family, or anyone else they know. And in the movie, Leto takes advantage of the tiger attack to sneak away and let his twin sister think he died. 
I really hate that change. I said before that I really, really love the dynamic between Leto and Ganema in this series. I think they really, really got that right. That's the one moment where I agree. That's a change that affects fundamental things about the story and fundamental things about who these characters are. Yeah, because now instead of Leto and Ganema together deciding Leto has to go find Jakarutu, them deciding together, let's let the assassins think they succeeded. Them deciding together, this will help protect us from Alia if she thinks one of us is dead and the other one is her only remaining claim to remain as regent. Now it's just Leto just sort of fucking off on his own and doing this behind Ganema's back. Yeah, that note really was too bad. Otherwise, I really, really think they got that dynamic right. Like, they didn't go into all of the incesty elements from the book, but, like, you definitely get the impression they've shared a Folgers coffee or two. Um, there were incesty elements in the book? Oh, really? You don't remember the role play as Paul and Shani? I never really saw that as incesty. They literally get married at the end. Especially since in the book they're both ten. Oh yeah, there's a lot of creepy shit in that book. They get married at the end after Leto no longer has human genitals. Oh no, I'm not saying they consummated anything. It's a political thing, like every marriage in this world. But like, no, no, it's definitely there. It's definitely there in the book, and they definitely picked up on it in the series, but not in a way that's creepy or anything. It's just, you know, they're very softly lit, and they play Paul and Shani's love theme a lot when they're together. I, I, I did not see things that way. I don't remember seeing it that way in the book, and to the extent that it seems that way in the movie, I thought it was just because, you know, there's an actor and an actress on screen showing affection for each other. I mean, also, of course, there's an element of having taken every opportunity imaginable to have James McAvoy take his shirt off. Well, that's a major problem in conveying his transformation toward the end of Children. And this goes into some of the changes in the story. It also goes into some of the heady concepts that they have to convey, and that one, I'm not sure they really landed. Well, the whole thing in the book is that he's kidnapped by this Jakarutu siege, and he's looking for a way to escape, except he doesn't have a still suit, and so he can't survive the desert. Except in this movie, nobody fucking wears still suits anymore. Like, they've just completely forgotten about still suits. Yeah, they've totally abandoned still suits. In the book, he needs to find a way to survive the desert without a still suit, and that's why he covers himself in sand trout. Except in this, nobody fucking wears a still suit, and he doesn't cover himself in sand trout. He makes like a couple of little patches on the back of his hand and up his arm, and that's it. And then he has superpowers. The whole point of the sand trout is that it covers his skin to protect him. Having like one little patch on the back of his hand that slowly starts to grow up towards his neck scene by scene... That's not the way that works. The whole point of it is that the sand trout cover him as a protection, you know? You don't put, like, one little piece of metal on your arm and say, there, now I'm bulletproof. No, the whole point is that the metal is bulletproof. Not having the metal near you makes you bulletproof. Yeah, it's a very skillful bit of makeup design. But it doesn't convey his transformation at all. Yeah, in terms of conveying, like, the text of the story, It doesn't really get that concept across. That, I think, is one place where they did fail to depict what was happening in the book. And I don't know if that's a limitation of makeup, or if it's just a choice they made for the same reason that they always get rid of the still suits, because they just don't want to hide their actor. Yet, that's another area where I think James McAvoy really saved the whole thing. Because the way that he conveys the change in Leto does so much more for it than the text of the script and the way that it was portrayed in makeup in the actual series. 
the way that he portrays the change in Leto in different contexts, I think, is very interesting. When he finally has his scenes with the preacher, which is something else we can talk about being a difficulty in a visual medium. But when he finally has his scene with the preacher talking about the loneliness that he's felt, the yearning for his father, he conveys that as something that he felt in the past. Because now that he's made this choice, now that he has started on the golden path, he is more confident, he is more sure. He has his purpose and he is doing it. He is doing what he's been thinking about for so long. And then, when he shows up in court to confront Alia to interrupt Ghanima's wedding to the nicest, softest boy, he conveys it so much more the strength and the confidence of the character. And the strangeness and alienness, even in a context where people have the weirding way, and even in a context where people have prana bindu self-control and all that, he still conveys another level of alienness. That the way that they did it in terms of makeup and, and visually portraying it doesn't really. He still saves the whole thing. James McAvoy succeeds at playing the character in some scenes as soft and gentle, and in other scenes as strong and commanding and projecting authority in the exact way that Jessica and Stilgar fail to. Ah, uh -huh, that is a good point. In the exact way that Gurney fails to. Gurney has a very, very small role. He obviously has the one highlight scene we're about to talk about, and it is incredible, but he has a very small role. Well, Gurney's role is mostly eliminated because his role in the book is that he's the one that's force-feeding Leto spice essence to test him to see if he succumbs to abomination. That is completely eliminated in this. Now it's the Jakarutu people that are doing it just for their own reasons. Yeah, were they testing him for abomination, or did they think it would just poison him? I think they were just trying to drive him insane. Well, it's basically what the abomination is. But in the book, Gurney is acting on orders of Jessica to force-feed him spice essence to see if he succumbs to abomination. And if he does succumb, then the Jakarutu people are supposed to kill him. Except the Jakarutu people conspire with themselves and decide we're just going to kill him anyway. Cursed be the name Atreides. Mm. And that's why he ultimately escapes by making his own still suit out of sand trout. I think they did the Preacher pretty well, actually. Probably about as well as you could. But as I was implying before, it is very, very hard to do in a visual medium. Like, he looks different enough, his voice is different, he looks rough like he spent ten years in the desert. I think they do the Preacher pretty well, and I love the scene between the Preacher and Leto on the sand dune. Absolutely. That is done really well, a lot of that dialogue comes straight out of the book. Alec Newman is one of the better performers in both of these miniseries, and we've already talked about how wonderful James McAvoy's performance is, so those two together, doing that scene, conveying those emotions, with a lot of the dialogue coming straight out of the book, I think that scene is just really, really well done. That scene is great. His scene with Gurney, too, I think is a real highlight, where he can't actually tell Gurney that he is Paul out of pity or out of compassion. Yeah. Because Gurney simply could not take it. And so he has to tell him that Paul's gone, no matter who he is. Yeah, that scene is like very, very, very condensed down from the scene from the book. Oh, of course. Now, this is another thing they changed a lot, is the entire ending. Because in the book, everyone sort of gets together to watch the preacher. Like, Faradin is there with Jessica, and they come in like, Hey, Alia, we heard you have the best view of the preacher. I want to see this mysterious preacher. And so Alia and Faradin and Jessica have all gathered to watch the preacher. And Alia sends her priests down into the crowd and tells them, After the preacher is done talking, bring him up here. Because she knows he's Paul. And so she's like, you know, after the preacher is done with his preaching... Bring him up here with me and Jessica. 
But then when the preacher says that there's one blasphemy remaining and that blasphemy is Alia, the priests are just so mortally offended by this that they murder the preacher instead of bringing him in like Alia told them to. Whereas in the movie, they completely turn that scene on its head where Alia is the one in the crowd shadowing him and he like pulls her out of the crowd to like show her and then it's the Jakarutu guy that kills him. So they completely turn that scene on its head and Gurney isn't even there in the book version. In the book version, Leto specifically leaves Gurney behind in the desert because he wants Gurney to survive. <laughs> like, that's stated explicitly. Paul asks, you know, what's Gurney going to do while we're going to Arakeen? And Leto says, I'm leaving Gurney behind because I want him to survive. <laughs> I want Gurney to survive because Stilgar needs his help bringing peace to this troubled land. So that is a complete change to have Gurney there at all. But you're right, that is like the best scene ever of Gurney hunting down the guy that killed Paul. It's so good, and it's so good the way they keep cutting back and forth. Yes! Like, as soon as Paul goes down, as soon as the Jakarutu guy starts running away, you see Gertie, they show Gertie, and he immediately turns and follows the assassin. Yes. Like, immediately. He doesn't try to run to Paul at all. He immediately knows, okay, that's a lost cause. He immediately turns and follows the assassin. And then they have, like, Leto comes running down and is, like, holding Paul in his arms, and Paul is dying in Leto's arms. And then they switch scenes and Gertie is chasing the assassin. And then they go back to Leto and Paul exchanging their final words. The only words they'll ever have. And then they go back to Gurney catching up with the assassin and grabbing him from behind. And then they go back to Leto and Paul and Leto is holding his father in his arms as his father dies. His father who he's only just met earlier that day. And then they switch back to Gertie's just like viciously stabbing the guy that killed Paul. <laughs> and then they go back to Leto and Paul, and Paul is like saying his dying words to his son as he dies in his arms. And then they go back to Gertie <laughs> viciously stabbing the assassin <laughs> again. Again. And then they go back, and Paul like breathes his last breath in Leto's arms, and Leto gives water to the dead over the body of his father. And then they switch scenes, and Gertie is stabbing the assassin again! <laughs> <laughs> oh god, I love it so! It is so, okay, like you say, it is completely not in the book at all, but it is perfect, it is perfect Gurney. It is glorious! That is Gurney's character. That is Gurney right there. I love that they go back three times! Yes! Like, they go back and he's chasing the guy, and then they go back and he catches the guy, and then they go back and he stabs him viciously, and then they go back and he's stabbing him some more, and then they go back a third time and he's stabbing him some more! <laughs> it's incredible. It's incredible. Oh, God, I love it so much! With that emotional music and the emotional scene between Paul and Leto, and then they just go back and he's stabbing him again! <laughs> I love it so much! And it's completely invented. It's not in the book at all, but I love it so much. Oh, yeah, it's perfect. The only other Dune scene that gives me that much joy was the first time I watched the book-accurate Duncan death in the new movie. <laughs> and that was just like a reaction to like, oh, finally, book-accurate Duncan's death. That's the only other thing that gave me as much visceral joy is that scene of Gertie just stabbing him again. <laughs> but yeah, that whole ending is changed. In addition to everything I just said about what goes on with the preacher, they also do that reunion between Leto and Ganema, which is a weird combination of carrying things over from the book because they were in the book, but also the changes that they made in the miniseries. Like, they reunite, and Ganema is, like, shocked that he's alive, because in this, she thought he was dead. But then she asks him, did our plan work? Because in the book... They had a plan. And in the book, she asks him, so our plan worked. And so in this scene, she asks him, so did our plan work? Even though in this, it wasn't their plan. And then like two sentences later, Lita was apologizing to her for letting her think he was dead. 
even though two sentences earlier, she was asking about a plan that the two of them had. So that's another dissonance between like what they did in the miniseries and what happened in the book and trying to do both of them at the same time, even though one of them doesn't fit anymore. Well, yes. Once you pointed that out, that did kind of stand out as discordant. Again, one of the rare times that their relationship in this show felt that way. I mean, I guess they didn't want to try to explain her, like, memory trick to convince herself that he was dead, but... Yeah, the, like, self-hypnosis or whatever that was, that might have been one concept too many to cram in there. Yeah, I suppose. I just really hate that. That they took the twins conspiring together and plotting together and turned it into one of the twins tricking the other. I hate that. Then that next scene is another one that they changed to make it more visually interesting, where he has that whole fight with all of Alia's guards, where he's like moving too fast to see, and that fight that goes on for several minutes as he beats up guard after guard after guard. Whereas in the book, he just uses his new strength to, like, hurl a giant metal door at them all, and after that, no one's willing to attack him. <laughs> well, I mean, we need to have some action scenes in here. I already said before, I thought that they portrayed Alia's possession actually pretty well. Her deterioration as time went on, her falling more and more into the possession, her falling more and more under the influence of her memory of the Baron. I thought that they actually did a really good job of portraying that. And also in this ending scene, I think they did a good job of showing her possession. Like they show her, you know, lashing out in anger. They show her speaking in tongues because she has memories going back thousands of years of thousands of different dead languages. And so she's just talking in a multitude of different languages. They show that. I think that scene is actually done really well. And the change they make in the way that she dies. I guess it's more visually dramatic. I don't know. There are a couple of little notes in Alia's performance that I really, really loved. But the rest of the performance, I didn't. A lot of the scenes of her possession I thought were a little too movie crazy, where she would just kind of grab the sides of her head and pull her hair and writhe around a little. Well, okay, but that's just, like, you know, adding something visual so the audience knows what's going on, you know? That's like a cue for the audience. No, I know. I mean, I get it. It just came across as too stereotypical, I think. The first bit of her performance that I really, really liked was at the beginning of episode two, the beginning of the children part of the story, where Jessica arrives on Arrakis and Alia is overjoyed to see her because she needs this source of comfort and she hugs jessica and seems to relax for a moment and then she feels jessica's head turn to look at the grandkids and her entire demeanor changes because jessica will not be a comfort to her she's not there for her she's there for the kids and her entire life at this point the only reason she has power is the kids and her entire life is revolving around the kids and she already had some deal of resentment of Paul's role, because in the Messiah portion, there was the part where she started overdosing on spice to try to duplicate his powers and all that kind of thing, to introduce the spice trance that Leto went through later, and that Alia would try again later. But you see, in that one little moment, the resentment solidify. Like, there's no changing that now. There was a chance, maybe, someone could have helped her. After that moment, there's no helping her. Like, the rest of the plot is set in stone for her. That moment I really loved. That one little moment, I think, conveyed a lot. And also, her death scene, like, after she stabs herself, her scene with Jessica, I think she played very well. When she reaches up her finger to pick up the tear and licks it off, I thought that was a really nice touch. That was a fantastic little touch in that moment. Absolutely. That was such a great callback. I love that. Yeah, and the way she almost retreats into a more innocent, kind of childish demeanor that she never had even as a child. You know, when she kind of whimpers out, I want my brother. That little moment I thought was really very good. The rest of her performance I didn't connect with. Yeah, 
that's understandable. Like I said, I think they showed her deterioration pretty well, but that didn't rest totally on her performance. That was also done with makeup. That was also done with wardrobe. And that was also done with the Baron. Would you like to talk about the Baron a little? I thought they played the Baron pretty well. Like, him presenting himself as a savior, as someone who could protect her from the other voices. That was very manipulative Baron. Yes. That was in character. The Baron egging her on to sleep with a bunch of the young men. Yeah. (laughs) Oh, he would have loved Faradin. The goodest, softest boy. Such a beautiful boy. Such a beautiful boy. They actually did less of that in the miniseries. Was that even more explicit in the book? I honestly don't remember. I was not clued into these things in the year of our Lord Beyonce 2001. Well, in the book, there is a scene where after Duncan kills Javid, where the person who comes from the siege back to the palace to report to Alia that Duncan killed Javid and then was killed by Stilgar, and now Stilgar has left the siege and is out hiding in the desert, which in the book, he still had Ghanima with him at that point, because in the book, Stilgar doesn't just hand her back over. But the person who comes to report that to her, she then goes to bed with him. (laughs) (sighs) Okay. And she specifically tells her attendant, you know, after he reports and he's on his way back out, she tells the attendant, you know, have him stay, send him to my bedchamber, but make sure he's washed and perfumed first. He smells like a worm. Oh my God. (laughs) So yes, there's actually less of the betting a bunch of hot young guys to appease the Baron within. There's less of that in the miniseries than there actually is in the book. Oh my God. Bless the coming and the going of him. Oh, God. You just reminded me. That opening scene of children where they're in the thopter and Leto flies up to the worms. Yeah. Which, by the way, why are all those worms, like, gathered together and just sticking themselves up in the air like that? Oh, for fun. Like, they did that in the Water of Life scene in the 84 movie, and it was astonishingly fucking stupid then, and so I can't really excuse it here. But I was watching that scene, and I actually wrote in my notes, it would be a really nice touch if, at this point, Leto and Ganemo were to say, bless the maker and his water, bless his coming and his going. And then, like, ten seconds later, Leto says, bless the maker and his water, bless his coming and his going. And I'm like, okay, (laughs) thank you, movie. Thank you. Yeah, good on (laughs) you. Since we've been talking about changes they made in the second half of Children, and which ones were okay and which ones really weren't, One thing that really bothered me, probably a lot more than it has any right to, the last line of the book Children of Doom, Uh, one of us had to accept the agony, and he was always the stronger. That is one of the great final lines. I mean, come on. How do you improve on that? It's so good as the final line in the book. And they have that line in Jessica Brooks's dialogue at the end of the movie. Like, just quoted verbatim, because you can't improve on it. And then they do a voiceover after it. Like, why? Why are they so dedicated to fucking voiceovers in these adaptations? (laughs) That they have to step on one of the great final lines of anything ever! With a fucking voiceover! (laughs) That tells us nothing! And if they're going to have a voiceover at the end, the voiceover should have ended with the saga of Dune is far from over. They didn't even do that. Well, I mean, they're not going to do that cliffhanger when there's no more miniseries to go. Uh, One thing I noticed is that in that voiceover, she says that one door is closed and another is opened and behind it is the future. So apparently she's talking about the door to Dukat's secret chamber. No one is blessing his coming and his going. Maybe his going. Oh, wow. Did I just make a reference even you didn't get? Oh, the other Dukat. (laughs) You don't remember Dukat's secret chamber from the In the Beginning movie? I remember it now. Yes, I got it eventually. (laughs) Oh, that's embarrassing. Oh, that's embarrassing. 
Is that staying in the show? <laughs> like, if you don't get my references, then I really am a culture of one. <laughs> so overall, I actually think these are two really good adaptations. Messiah, I think, is really good. The first half of Children, I'm a huge fan of. The second half of Children has its problems, but I still think overall it's pretty good. I know it goes without saying at this point, but God, McAvoy really lifts this whole thing up. <laughs> there are a lot of strong elements, aside from his performance, and we've talked about a bunch of those. A lot of good screenwriting decisions, some iffy screenwriting decisions, but some good screenwriting decisions, some good production design decisions, some good acting choices. But he really lifts the whole thing up. So overall, I agree. For Messiah and Children, I think it's a really, really successful adaptation. I think they really did a good job on this one. If anything, maybe better than the adaptation of the original. Well, that's what I was going to say next. I mean, accepting the issues with how they do the second half of Children, is this adaptation of Dune Messiah better than any adaptation of the original novel has been yet? From my perspective, the experience that I had reading the books and then watching these series, I think Messiah probably is the best one. The tone, I think, is really good, and some of the characterization, I think, was really well spotted. Yeah, I remember feeling that way in 2003 when we first saw this, and watching it again now, on the heels of watching all of the others, I still feel that way. Yeah, I'm glad we decided to tack this on to Dune Watch. <laughs> Speaking of tacking things on to Dune Watch, next time we will start our Dune Listen part of Dune Watch. We still have to talk about the scores, because this is who we are and what we do on this show. So, next time we will talk about the miniseries scores Frank Herbert's Dune by Grem Ravel and Children of Dune by Brian Tyler. I know you're looking forward to that, Scott, and we hope you are too, listeners. So, if you have any questions, comments, or suggestions for the show, you can find us at Nontoxic Fanboys on Twitter and Facebook, or you can email us at nontoxicfanboys at gmail.com. If you'd like to support the show, you can do that at patreon.com slash nontoxicfanboys. And you can find all of this info, plus every episode of the podcast, and all of our other accounts like our YouTube channel, our Twitch channel, and our Discord server, all listed at our website, nontoxicfanboys.com. The theme music to this podcast is Discovery by Alexander Nakarada. Details are in the episode description. Thank you all for listening. We will see you next time. Even in a context where people have the weirding way, and even in a context where people have parabrin... Parabindu? Prarabindu? What's the fucking phrase? Pranabindu, I believe? Pranabindu, thank you.